Hello, I'm Justin Smith, Director of the Cinema and Television History Institute here at De Montfort University. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this event marking World Television Day. I'll be introducing a panel of DMU experts to present new research and give you details of, of new projects that we're involved with across a range of topics that speak to today's theme, which is television beyond borders. We're interpreting this theme widely to consider boundaries of geography, nationhood, culture, gender and race. The new millennium has seen profound changes in television culture with the growth of the global market exacerbated by streaming services uh, of on-demand providers such that the long-standing ideas of national television, of curated TV schedules and of public service broadcasting itself have been challenged by new production and consumption models raising fundamental questions about the nature of the medium itself. Is Netflix, for example, a television service at all, insofar as we understand the term? At the same time, the widely respected traditions of public service broadcasting in the UK have come under renewed political scrutiny, from the future of the BBC licence fee to the spectre of privatising Channel 4. In the UK, the PSBs have also undergone changes in their own relationship with independent programme makers, partial devolvement of their operations to regional centres such as Manchester, Cardiff, Bristol, Glasgow and Leeds, and long overdue attention to matters of diversity and inclusion, both on and off screen. This afternoon's panellists will address different aspects of this post-millennial transformation in television culture through exploring a number of different historical perspectives. I'll be introducing each speaker in turn and we'll finish up with a roundtable discussion and the opportunity then for you, our audience, to ask questions via the chat facility. We hope you'll find today's presentations informative and stimulating. Thanks for joining us in this discussion. The first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Julia Havas. She's a lecturer here in media studies in Leicester Media School, and she's an expert in Anglo-Americans television, uh, television's gender and race politics and its relationship to cultural value, streaming culture, Hungarian film and television, and the transcultural flow of media. Julia's monograph, Woman Up, Invoking Feminism in Quality Television, is forthcoming with Wayne State University Press next spring. Julia, over to you. Thank you, Justin, and welcome everyone uh, to this event. Um, now, I'm going to uh, talk, as you can see on, from my slide, uh, um, basically about Eastern European television's relationship to British TV culture. Uh, my talk is titled uh, Beasts from the East, Fantasies of Eastern Europeanness in Streaming Era British Drama. Um, also, a bit of an apology uh, before I start speaking. I have a bit of a cough, dry cough, not COVID-related, but hopefully it won't uh, affect too much uh, uh, my talk today. Anyway, so... Um, Basically, I'm going to what I'm going to do this uh, today is discuss the um, sort of uh, cultural and political geography uh, of this relationship between Britishness, British television, and Eastern European TV culture, uh, with also some considerations uh, of how this is affected by, by streaming, by streaming cultures. This is something that has recently become the focus of my research, and it's of course quite quite timely in sort of this post Brexit era, which has brought uh, to the fore this uh, in some ways strained relationship between the UK and uh, Eastern European citizens. But before delving to this in many ways com complicated relationship, uh, allow me to share a piece of personal memory about my and my family's experiences of TV viewing in 1980s Hungary, where I hail from. 
So basically, I'm going to do a bit of uh, autoethnography, if you like, which might be illuminating for uh, some of the complexities I'm going to talk about in my uh, today later. So um, I grew up in a city in southern Hungary, but spent most of my summers as a kid in the 1980s at my grandparents' farmhouse in the countryside. Uh, we can see the image on the left. Um, that's, the, that's the sort of farmhouse. Um, their farm was a few kilometers outside of a of a small village in the middle of a territory called the Great Hungarian Plain, or in Hungarian, the Pusta. It was in the late 1970s that my grandparents got their first uh, TV set, which was a, a black and white unionist, uh, you can see on the right, on the top. Um, and this TV set initially, well, it, it received power from a generator because electricity at that time was not lit, not installed on the farm yet. It was only in the 1980s, early 1980s, that electricity, that electricity was in, installed. And uh, their second uh, TV set was a black and white Orion, uh, which uh, was powered through, through uh, electricity. Uh, so basically what I'm saying here is that effectively they got a TV set uh, years before they actually got electricity. In, on the farm. And in my memory of spending childhood summers there, watching television with my grandparents and my cousins in the evening as a communal uh, domestic activity takes central place. And there's one specific memory that I want to share here about this. Um, so uh, the programming that we would typically watch together was a mixture of East German, Hungarian, British and American uh, crime and adventure series, um, the likes of which you can see it's sort of posters of, so Columbo, Kojak, Starsky and Hutch, Dempsey and Makepeace, all sorts of British drawing room mystery, murder mysteries, uh, adventure series and the like. And as we would watch, a recurring joke for us kids would be to make fun, tenderly make fun, uh, of our grandmother and her mode of TV viewing. Whatever grisly or even light crime and adventure plots were going on in the foreground, my grand would make wistful remarks about how beautiful the landscapes and the sceneries were. So she would say stuff like, uh, look at those beautiful hills and how lovely is the sea in the background and so on. Uh, but the actual stories were of a minor importance to her. Of course, she was a peasant woman who lived uh, in the Pusta her whole life in a landlocked country and never left Hungary until well into her 80s. So this black and white TV was literally her window to the world, which uh, is an expression us TV scholars often use and interrogate in our research and teaching in relation to the novelty of the TV set um, as a kind of cultural object uh, uh, in the living room in, from the 1950s and 60s onwards. Looking back, I now understand how my grand related to the TV set, but as kids, me and my, <coughs> excuse me, me and my cousins looked at her relationship with the, tele, with the younger generation's often cruel amusement at, at their elders' uncool un un lack of media savviness. We considered ourselves TV savvy and TV literate, who appreciate the plotting of a Starsky and Hutch episode and don't sentimentalize the novelty of television and the accessibility of distant and pretty landscapes in the living room in the living room that it affords. Now, many aspects of this memory could be unpacked here, uh, which I don't have time for. But one thing I want to highlight here uh, for our purposes here, that are, are the kids uh, self-regard as modern TV savvy uh, um, consumers of transnational, but also Hungarian programming, as we were set in the living room of a small farm farmhouse in Hungary. This self-regard certainly complicates the popular and stereotypical myth of Eastern Europeanness behind the Iron Curtain and even after the Cold War, uh, which is often framed in Western cultures as a cultural space uh, of, I quote, scarcity, homogeneity and brainwashing, uh, which is a quote coming from the TV scholar Oliko Imre in her book TV Socialism. She also uh, used this, the phrase Europe's backyard as a kind of the stereotype uh, to describe Eastern Europeanness in, in relation to Western Europeanness. Both Imre and myself have written about the untenability of this cliche by demonstrating not only the historic permeability of Eastern and Western Europe's media cultures, but also the long traditions of transcultural, cultural, regional travels of TV products across socialist nations themselves. So after this kind of uh, sort of personal memory, uh, let me now turn to the present day status of this relationship, specifically the post-Brexit relations of the United Kingdom and Eastern Europe as projected onto TV culture and production keeping this historical uh, context in mind. 
so I'd like to talk about uh, a, a piece of sort of a project that I've I've completed uh, recently. Uh, it's an international cooperative research uh, that I completed with two colleagues, uh, Gabor Gerger and Anna Martonfi. And the title of today's talk comes from this project as well. So it's it's called Beast from the East: Fantasies of Eastern Europeanness in Brexit Era BBC Drama. And I'm going to uh, present some of our findings here. We analyzed a handful of contemporary prestige BBC series that were made with the global market in mind, uh, since they are also available uh, for streaming internationally on Netflix. Our case studies were, as you can see, uh, the Salisbury Poisonings, the recent Dracula miniseries, Killing Eve, and the specific plot thread of Call the Midwife. We made the point that an increasing number of such programming uses the fantasy figure of the Eastern European foreigner in the UK, as a figure associated with contagion, geographic, par geographic parasitism, deviance, and savagery, who threatens the integrity of the host nation by infiltrating themselves into it through their sed seductive appeal and versatile skills at mimicking its customs and culture, which masks their innate beastliness. And actually, this title, Beast from the East, comes from the Swasbury poisoning itself, which uses this epithet in the first episode's title sequence. So for those of you who are not familiar with this series, it recounts the story of the 2018 attempt on the life of former Russian military officer and spy, Sergei Skripal, and her daughter, Yulia, who were fined poison with the nerve agent, Novichok, on a Salisbury bench. The series is exclusively preoccupied with how the poisoning affects the local British community, with no concern for the actual targets, the Skripals, whom it treats as, a, as, to, as the toxic agents that brought this threat into that national community. And uh, specifically, this descriptor Beast from the East is actually what the tabloid press had christened a weather system responsible for the cold spell that reached southern England in March 2018. And you can see here the first few images uh, from the opening se sequence of the series and how this uh, descriptor is deployed. So basically, basically uh, it deploys uh, to uh, the, this descriptor Beast from the East to strategically conflate this uh, climate change induced weather event, extreme weather event, with anti-democratic Russian politics by illustrating the headline and weather reports with images of Vladimir Putin. We argued in this piece that such portrayals in this series might seem to contradict the BBC's declared commitment to representing diversity and the multicultural Britain, but only seemingly since, this very, since the very coherence of this multicultural and tolerant Britain is predicated in this, series, in this series on xenophobic fear-mongering against East European infiltrators of a coherent British national body. And it's, of course, of crucial importance that these imaginaries are expressed on BBC programming, since the broadcaster is both domestically and internationally associated with the national character, with quintessential Britishness. The BBC's commitment to post-colonial, post-empire <coughs> post anti-racism makes it harder to spot the simultaneously occurring projection of racist xenophobia onto the figure of the parasitic Eastern European, whose apparent whiteness this anti-racism seems to confirm. In scholarship, this is called the xeno-racism or cultural racism, a process in which nationalist exclusion becomes legitimized by categorizing cultural and national difference as not quite whiteness, or in the words of the scholar Josef Pürötz, dirty whiteness. Again, it's important that the notable increase in BBC drama configurations of the Eastern European as contagious, parasitic, yet de uh, deceptively seductive other happens in tandem with the BBC's increased post-empire, post-colonial tolerance discourse in the streaming age. Such programs performatively imagine a British national identity characterized by frictionless ethnic diversity, while exploiting dehumanizing xeno-racist stereotypes of the itinerant Eastern European other in fictionalized representations of the United Kingdom's nostalgia-tinted past and Brexit-inflected present. The construction of a national space, whether aimed at a domestic audience addressed as the community that inhabits that space or at an international audience via Netflix, inevitably entails the exclusion of, a, of certain bodies that are coded as failing to meet criteria for acceptance into that imagined community. So let me now move on to yet another aspect of the xeno-racist relationship between TV cultures of the UK and Eastern Europe. And I will do so by outlining a project I'm currently develop developing, uh, which is called, as you can see here, Runaway Productions in Hungary. Uh, so this project engages with the increased importance in British and also Hollywood media production of filming in Eastern European locales to reduce production costs, and specifically in Hungary. That is, for the past decade, Hungary has become the second largest hub in Europe after London for, the, for these so-called runaway productions. 
by offering a generous tax incentive scheme and the cheap labor of non-unionized local crew members, so-called below the line wage workers, who work under poorly regulated conditions such as non-maximized uh, work shifts. A notable commonality among the types of projects film in, filmed in Hungary is the preponderance of science fiction, fantasy, horrors, <coughs> horror, spy and crime genres and lavish historical drama series, as you can see from these examples, indicating that Hollywood and British productions use these sites as fantasy spaces onto which Anglo-American imaginaries can be successfully projected. Let me share two examples of how this trans transnational production culture is framed in industry and promotional discourses. So the first one, uh, this is a, a page from, uh, probably you can see the, the wording, so I'm going to uh, read uh, out the relevant bits, but this is basically a page from the website of Korda Studio, which is the largest Hungarian studio for runaway productions, and how it uh, this um, site frames um, the attractiveness of Hungary for Hollywood and British projects on its English language website. So the very first advantage of filming in Hungary on this website is listed as, I quote, experience an English speaking professional crew with 12 hours working day shifts and no unions, unquote. That is, the studio does not beat around the bush in offering up its own Hungarian personal for exploitation by Anglo-American productions and reassures its Western clients of the unprotectedness of those workers from such exploitative working conditions. And the second tidbit I would like to offer is a quote from an English director working on the BBC, the Netflix project or series, uh, The Last Kingdom. Um, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this series, it's basically set in the ninth, in ninth century England and its plot revolves around the Saxon king, kings defending their young country from Viking invasion. So this is very much about British nation building and, and protectionism. And it is shot in corner studios and recurrently uses the surrounding Buddha hills of the Etek um, wine region, uh, west of Budapest for location shooting. This historical fantasy of nation building then uses pretty, uh, sorry, uh, Hungarian backdrops to play out this fantasy. And in a promotional article published in Radio Times, this is how series director John East describes the attractiveness of the location. And I quote uh, at length here from, the, from uh, um, the article, For the last kingdom, Hungary offers many unspoiled acres of unfarmed and unbordered grassland and forest. <coughs> Excuse me. These are hard to find in the UK, where walls and fences fragment the landscape, clearly announcing that it's not a ninth century world. It's cheaper to shoot abroad in a virgin, quote unquote, virgin landscape than it is to digitally remove all the trappings of the 21st century in post production, unquote. I think it's bone chilling that such gendered colonialist language can be openly used in promotional material, but such blatant admittance to exploitative power relations is a recurring motive in runaway production discourses in relation to Eastern Europe. There would be a lot, a lot to unpack here. Um, I don't have time for and I'm going to sort of uh, work on in my project and I'm not happy to discuss the details of this further in the Q&A. Uh, but as a final thought, I'd like to stress that the fact that this language comes in the context of the BBC and from an English crew member underlines the questionable nature of the post-colonial diversity discourse of British public service broadcasting. And it is in dialogue with the ways BBC dramas fictionalize Eastern Europeans as parasitic infiltrators of the national landmass. So this is very much about territoriality. Whether British dramas depicting Eastern European, Europeans as savage parasites infiltrating the British landmass, or British productions using Hungarian landscapes as unfarmed virgin territory to be used as backdrops to British nation building, these relations betray the openly colonialist and racist attitude of, the post, of, of this uh, post-empire TV culture towards Eastern Europe. So as a final thought, it turns out that my gran was actually right, and those lovely years in the background do matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Julia, for that stimulating uh, opening presentation, which uh, draw, really draws attention both to uh, the nature of xenophobia in, in, in drama representation on screen and to the rather sinister um, production cultures which uh, hide behind that. Uh, fascinating project indeed. We move on now to our second speaker, Dr. Govinda Orjla Sidhu is Associate Professor in Journalism here at De Montfort University and previously worked for 10 years in BBC Radio. She is Associate Head of School uh, of Leicester's uh, Leicester Media School 
and also a lead member on the Decolonising DMU project, which aims to examine and understand the challenges BAME students face in higher education. Govinda is going to be talking about a new post, uh, a new doctoral project that um, we've got running here at uh, DMU, which uh, explores um, the culture of ZTV, one of the uh, first uh, ethnic media broadcasters. And her paper is entitled Broad Broadcasting to the Diaspora Globally, a Collaborative Doctoral Project. Govinda. Thank you, Justin. Um, so yes, so we're kind of moving from East Europe, Eastern European uh, to India now and also to the UK. So as Justin said, I'm going to speak about um, a doctoral award that Justin and I designed and it's focused around ZTV. Um, and this is because we have the some archives um, stored at Montfort University, um, which is from the ZTV uh, collection that's been filmed and uh, put together in the UK. So you can see on my next slide that um, ZTV is basically classified as an ethnic media organisation. Um, and ethnic media can be satellite television, it can be radio, it can be print and former magazines and newspapers. Um, but obviously for this presentation, I'm going to focus on satellite TV. Um, satellite television offers uh, diasporic communities across the world a means to develop their own unique affiliation to their uh, communities abroad and communities here in the UK as well. It's suggested that this type of media content also allows people to identify with their homeland and then for the subsequent later generations, it allows them to access and view content that promotes their mother tongue language and also showcases parts of their culture and their heritage back to them. So this type of content, therefore, then has two purposes for the two different sort of identifiable groups there. Um, now, Marie Gillespie um, had a really unique ethnographic study back in the early 1990s. She studied the viewing habits of a number of Indian families who at the time lived in West London. Um, and she found that the first and the second generation parents wanted their children to view uh, content that was ethnic so that they could learn their language and then, as a result, maintain their language links. Um, in Gillespie's studies, she watched families that used to watch this uh, epic programme that was broadcast on BBC Two called the Mahabharat. It was broadcast between 1988 and 1990, and there was a, it's a, of a Hindu mythical series and it has 94 episodes in total. And I remember viewing this content with my own mum uh, back as a teenager. But the problem with this particular study, with so what Gillespie found, which is quite unique, that how people want language uh, content, is that her study predated the arrival of uh, satellite television services in the UK. So therefore we can't assess what has been the impact of a service such as ZTV. So on the next slide, you can see a little bit of information about how ZTV UK emerged here. It was originally launched in India as a private channel. And in India, their sort of system of broadcasting uh, pre-ZTV was kind of similar to the, to the British model, um, whereby they had national uh, television stations, which I think historically are quite described as quite conservative and sort of, sort of quite dull. So ZTV as a private channel made a significant um, impact uh, to their television viewing. Three years later, ZTV made its international debut here in the UK in 1995. And soon, uh, soon you know, a little while later, they opened a newsroom specifically in London. Um, initially, the owner of ZTV partnered with another group called the Star Group um, in India, and then Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation uh, Limited acquired the rights to distribute Star TV's content in the 1990s. With News Corp as its partner, Z also founded another channel called City Cable in 1995, and in March 2000, ZTV brought out the stakes of the News Corp stakes um, and the City Cable business. Now, coming back here to the UK, um, the UK newsroom was tasked with producing content, with specifically news content for British Asian audiences, and this content was broadcast in English. Um, the news content wasn't interestingly targeted at any specific language group or any um, sort of national community, but they kind of wanted to target all communities. 
And Anita Renand was one of the key journalists and the presenters at the time. She presented the talk show, The Big Debate, and she was also the political correspondent for a series of programmes called Raj Britannia series. And these are 31 documentaries that went into marginal constituencies in the big 1997 uh, landmark election. Now, these a number of archives are stored in the special collections at DEMU, but in particular, this presentation is focusing on the Raj Britannia series of 31 uh, documentaries. Um, CTV was one of the first Indian satellite TV channels in the UK, um, and therefore it must have had sort of a, an impact um, before the other channels arrived. And now, interestingly, there's over 40 different television services for uh, Asian communities to subscribe to. Now, some of them do broadcast uh, in specific languages, and some of them are targeted at specific national communities, as opposed to broadcasting in English and targeting all communities like the ZTV originally did. And that's similar to what the BBC does as well. The BBC have um, an ethnic radio service called the BBC Asian Network, which broadcasts in English to all British Asian communities. So, we wanted to design um, a study utilising the archives that we have. So on my next slide, you will see that um, what we did was we designed a collaborative doctoral project. Um, we have a few questions in mind, but really what we kind of wanted to find out was what was the legacy and the impact on the communities who were watching this early ZTV content? Um, we also wanted to know what was the ex early experience like on, on cable TV or via the Sky Satellite Dish, and how did this then shape viewing habits amongst the South Asian diaspora, and how importantly did they feel about the reflection of their particular identity and their culture on ZTV as in contrast to something that was presented to them on Channel 4 or the BBC. Now, research into ethnic media by um, Professor Sarita Malik sets out that diaspora television has become a very powerful mechanism for those sharing common cultural concerns. And these concerns can be religion, it can be language, ethnicity, and they can use these kind of um, uh, satellite TVs to defend their collective interests. She also alludes to the impact of such content by suggesting that the ways in which these communities' um, identities are practiced and performed sorry, my, just removing my cat out of the way, um, and representing through the medium raises important cultural and commercial issues for Europe's public service broadcasters who have long legitimated their position in the nation state as a source of public value. And that kind of comes back to what um, uh, Dr. Julia Havis was talking about, um, you know, what this idea of having uh, the nation state and how we kind of speak in that. The key difference with a service such as ZTV, though, is that it's um, actually a foreign ethnic service. So what's quite interesting here is the question is how the identities that they offer on ZTV, how do they shape and influence people's uh, British identities here in the UK? To do a collaborative doctoral award, though, whilst we had these questions, was we needed a partner. Um, and whilst we have uh, particular research questions for the study, we were quite aware that a partner would influence and shape this study, and also they may have particular questions of their own. So we have chose, we ended up working with an organisation called SAMPAD, and on the next slide you will sort of see a little bit about the different projects that they do. They are basically an arts and heritage organisation based in the West Midlands, and they play a really important role in creating and promoting opportunities for South Asian arts and artists uh, to showcase their work. And this slide kind of gives you an idea of some of the different types of projects and works that they've been doing. And um, they decided to partner with us to study the ZETV archives. Um, and basically this provides Sampad an opportunity to amplify and promote British produced Asian content um, and also it offers the PhD student an opportunity to engage with um, different communities, um, because Sampad it works in the community. And so this is quite a great opportunity for the PhD student to engage with the communities and learn about them. But also they are going to learn a range of skills um, with Sampad that we can then utilize for the study as well. Um, so, uh, what we hope the study will demonstrate is that television, like other media, uh, operates across borders. And as a result of this, this challenges our ideas of what nationality or the nation is. Um, and this kind of media also challenges um, people's preconceived ideas of what identity is or identity as it's determined by others. And by this, I'm alluding to how 
public service broadcasting in this country, uh, for example, the BBC and Channel 4, have um, constructed programming and content for minority communities, but really with an idea of what people's identity is and place that in the forefront of those particular programmes. Um, so SAMPAD were really keen to promote the archives um, and kind of like acknowledge that what part they've had in British Asian media history. So that would be really interesting. So finally, on my final slide, um, what, do, what are the benefits of a collaborative doctoral award? Well, the PhD student gets to have um, an insight in, and the support of a working organisation such as SAMPAD. And they also are supported by the academic partnership as well from, um, from De Montfort University. Um, in particular, SAMPAD are going to help facilitate the student to engage with the various different generations of the Asian communities in Birmingham, and that's for the purpose of this doctoral study. And sometimes when you're designing a collaborative doctoral award, the uh, partner may be sort of uniquely and um, drawn in with the study, or they may sort of be a partner on the sides where some of the work contributes to, to the study. Um, the student will also gain confidence um, and develop new skills, which they wouldn't ordinarily develop in the process of just doing a straightforward PhD. Um, in this case, their skills will contribute directly to this particular research study. Um, as part of a collaborative doctoral award, the student also gets a supervisor from the organisation, so in this case from SAMPAD. So what we thought was this created a really unique opportunity to study uh, uh, the ZTV archives to engage with the public like we wanted to for the purposes of the doctoral award, but also to work with a professional Asian arts group and then to showcase this work so that the archives that we have at, um, at the library are shared with the public because the public have already reached out to the library to sort of say that they would like to, you know, to see more of, of the archives and, and kind of reminisce and look back on, on their personal histories as well. So that for us was the most important thing that the archives are brought out into the public realm, which we hope to do at the end of this particular study. Um, and for the particular study, we obviously chose to go with the Midlands Four Cities because Democrat University works in that partnership. And we were really pleased that we recruited a student who began in um, October this year. So we are now underway with this study. And it's been a really interesting journey. And some of the partners that we spoke to along the way that we didn't actually choose to work with might be partners that we could go back with and work with on other projects as well. So that's it from me. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Govinda. And thanks for showcasing that um, really exciting collaborative doctoral award and the way it draws on uh, our resources here at DMU in conjunction with our valued partnership with the Midlands Four Cities Doctoral Training uh, partnership and uh, has potential to, to grow new research areas through our postgraduate research culture. Moving on to our third speaker this afternoon, Dr. Vicky Ball is Senior Lecturer in Cinema and Television Histories here at DMU and is the Principal Investigator on a BA Levyhulme project entitled Play for Today at 50 women writers and writing women into histories of British television drama. She was previously co-investigator on the AHRC funded project, Women's Work, Working Women, a longitudinal study of women working in the film and television industries in the UK. And most recently, she's the co-editor of Structures of Feeling, Contemporary Research in Women's Film and broadcasting history. And it's that rich uh, broadcasting history uh, around play for today that she's talking about this afternoon in a paper entitled Crossing Scholarly Borders and Challenging Androcentric Histories of British Television Drama. Vicky. Hi Justin, thank you so much and uh, welcome everybody and thank you to Julia and Govinda for um, their great papers today. So as Justin said there, this paper comes out of my current research project which explores the contribution women have made to play for today and in turn that comes out of a sort of bigger broader project that I'm, that I'm sort of um, uh, engaged with 
which is really trying to flesh out what contributions and what kind of labour histories around women in um, British television drama historically. Um, but so if you like, Play for Today and my current project is a sort of case study um, within that, that history. Um, and uh, my project um, looks at the significance of the single play in histories of television to British TV drama and along with looking at the gender politics within those production cultures, along with women's creative contributions to them. But for anyone who's not familiar with Play for Today or needs a bit of a recap, Play for Today was the BBC's um, flagship play series, which ran for an incredible 14 years between 1970 and 1984. Um, and uh, it celebrated its 50th anniversary last year um, in October. And so this project really piggybacks on that, um, that uh, big anniversary to begin to flesh out those sorts of politics of production around gender. Um, in largely because um, today uh, there's been very little research done around gender and play for today and indeed around gender and, and play production in the UK more generally. Um, I should, maybe should preface that now because there has been a, a recent proliferation because of things like that 50th anniversary. And I think an acknowledgement that we need to be more reflexive, reflexive about uh, TV histories themselves. But if we look at play for today, we can see perhaps why there's been that sort of critical neglect around gender and, uh, and the play series, largely because of the uh, alignment with pl single plays with masculinity. Play for today, for instance, if you think about play for today in, it, in its sort of legacy, you might think of the big kind of political plays um, the she at the stag and the black black oil or the or certain male auteurs mike lee um dennis potter for instance and indeed abigail's party mike lee's um classic uh, play um was voted um the most popular or most remembered play for today uh, last year um and you know adding credence if you like to uh that, that sort of masculine identity of play production we can see um, it's, it's, it's not kind of not difficult to draw that conclusion. So this is the sort of stats of play for today's production. And out of the 294 drop players that make up play for today, only 36 of them, in fact, 13% were written by women, only 68 were produced by women, only 13, and that mere 4% were directed by women. So again, we can see that sort of masculine identity. And indeed, um, the critical neglect of women's contributions to the single play can largely be um, attributed to the male dominance of the industry and the attendant invisibility of women in archives and television drama histories. Um, but that being the case, um, I guess it's those sorts of uh, histories that we also we still need to attend to, even if women have been seen to occupy um, a, a kind of less than prominent role um, and my own sort of research stems really from pedagogy of trying to teach about women writers and directors and producers and indeed women's labour histories within the industry. So I've got a module that I run called Gender and Television uh, Fictions, which looks at the work of women writers in, in TV drama historically. Um, and when I came to devise that module, it really did bring home to me how little critical work there was has been done around uh, women in, in play production. Um, you have some canonical pieces. Um, Irina Shubik, who was a producer, for instance, on Play for Today, wrote a book about her experience of writing for drama, but there was very little um, direct reference about gender politics of, of production. Really great source, but not exactly uh, central to what I want to look at here. You've got great pieces by Madeleine McMurray Kavanagh, who um, talked about gender in the Wednesday play, but as well as being a kind of paucity of critical work around the plays themselves, just, you know, finding out what dramas did women contribute to? What did they write? What did they produce? Um, it, it's even harder to actually obtain copies of the text themselves. And again, that, that scenario is changing with services like Box of Broadcasts, which we have access to here at DMU, and where some plays have, have now become available. But certainly there is still um, this kind of paucity, really, this invisibility of women's work and indeed their creative contributions to, to TV drama histories. And there's a real danger, therefore, and this is um, Julia Hallam talking uh, over 20 years ago now, um, there's, there's still this, this danger, really, that the work of women writers, along with um, you know, other forms of 
women's contributions to television drama, that their work remains unacknowledged and absent from the teaching canon. Unless we pay more attention to these female writers, their works, like that of their 19th century popular literary form of us, will rapidly become invisible as it disappears into television's amorphous flow. And I do feel that's what's happened to a certain degree um, in terms of you know, posed with the challenges of trying to research and teach women's television drama or television drama and gender at this particular moment in time. It's trying to therefore excavate those pieces of history and bring them back into, uh, into circulation. Um, as I said, there is some, uh, the, the picture is starting to change. There is um, building a sort of critical mass and indeed there has been over the past 20 years with many of the projects run by Professor Jonathan Bignall at, um, at the University of Reading, and more recently the work of the Forgotten Television Drama Project at Royal, from Royal Holloway. And indeed there was a lovely um, season of drama that was on there in, uh, uh, created by uh, Billy Smart and Dick Fiddy from that project. And one of the, or indeed a couple of the plays were from um, Play For Today. So, you know, good signs, uh, positive signs that things are starting to change in histories of, and historiography is becoming more reflexive. Um, my own way of tackling this has been uh, in, in terms of trying to, oh, I think there's going to be, I'm just going to shut the window, sorry, I think there's a, a more starting. Apologies, like commercial break. Um, my own way of tackling, if you like, some of the gaps and absences and trying to get data about the women who actually wrote, directed, produced and so on uh, television drama in the UK has been via a collaboration with the regional television archive Kaleidoscope and the wonderful Simon Coward um, uh, as part of that institution. Um, and what we've been trying to do is make their existing drama database searchable by gender. This is a great resource. I'm sure lots of people are familiar with it um, because the database itself and the researcher guides which come out from it list every single drama that's been produced since the emergence of television in the year in 1936 up until 2014, I think was the last update. Um, and again, it, it gives us production credits, for that particular around writer, producer and director. So being able to make that database searchable by gender has given us a, a sense about you know, the participation rates, the employment rates of men and women in, uh, in production. So from that um, number crunching exercise that we did, um, and I must say I got considerable help from colleagues in the field to identify the gender of those, those uh, figures in the database from Les Cook, Ian Greaves, Julia Hallam and Billy Smart. So thank you again to those people for helping substantially with this research. Um, so yeah, there's just short shy of 8,000 writers contained in the Kaleidoscope database. And I'm just looking at writers today rather than producers, directors as well. And out of that just shy of 8,000 writers, just over 1,600 of them are, are female, so 21%, and um, just under 6,000 writers within that database um, are male, so 79% of those writers. So on the one hand, those figures from the database do confirm the relatively low employment rates of women within television drama when we compare those with, uh, with men. Um, but perhaps it also suggests there's more writers than we first thought, particularly in earlier periods of television drama history. So, for instance, the 27 women writers who contributed those 36 plays to play for today, um, they are formed part of a, a larger workforce of 180 women writers in the 70s and 240 women writers in the 1980s. So that still, to me, signals quite a few women's uh, creative and labour histories that's yet to be explored. The second really interesting finding for, the, for my research was in finding that in actual fact where we presumed, or I'd certainly presumed, and it's a kind of common sense assumption perhaps, that more women kind of wrote for um, soaps historically, you know, that's seen as that, a classic feminine genre, but in actual fact, the majority of women employed as writers in British TV drama have actually been from plays and from series and serial drama. Um, and if I just show you this little graph, perhaps it gives you some sense of that. So the orange band is the, the percentage of women writing for, um, for plays drama. The, the band in blue is really series, series and serial drama. And so, so you can see at a glance, really, um, the way in which women's employment has been very much reliant upon a single play, as, is, as has men's employment within television. So if that gives you a, a, a hopefully a snapshot into 
um, those kind of shifting uh, uh, exploration, the shifting uh, understandings really of women's participation rates and employment rates in television drama. Um, this this project, my BA project around Play for Today, also um, uh, explores looking at women's employment rates um, with also the timing of, of, of what was happening in the 70s and 80s um, with regard to gender politics and indeed how you know gender politics behind the screen in relationship with the gender politics that were informed the, the writing of these women and, and what was produced for TV in this period. And indeed, Play for Today is a really sort of rich uh, history to look at because, as I say, gender politics were being highly contested. Indeed, there's a lot of gender trouble in the 70s and 80s. Not only did this period, you know, 1970 to 1984, um, see the consolidation of the second wave feminist movement, but it also saw shifting patterns of employment and of mobility for women, the Equal Pay Act, the Sex Discrimination Act, and not to mention the right, the move to the right in politics led by Britain's first female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. And we had these kind of ongoing battles for equality on both sides of the television screen. The BBC, for instance, on uh, in terms of television production, produced their own report in 1973 entitled The Limitations to the Recruitment and Advancement of Women in the BBC. Um, and the Union for Film and Television Workers uh, subsequently also produced um, a report called Patterns of Discrimination in 1975 because it was such an uh, um, obvious and, uh, uh, you can imagine, extremely emotive issue with regard to employment rates. And indeed, uh, on this little slide, you might not get so much of a sense of it, but certainly women's participation uh, rates, employment rates began to drop in the 60s and 70s to almost uh, that akin to those levels in the 30s and 40s in, in percentage terms. Um, so, you know, there was the, all of these kind of politics, which um, hopefully the project will start to um, engage with more this year. Um, but also, if we think about um, the, the, the plays themselves and who was writing for and um, playing for today, we can see how gender politics um, informs their experiences of writing for play for today. And indeed, hopefully what this research will do in terms of linking back to pedagogy is hopefully uh, make these histories more visible and particularly women's pathways through the industry as writers um, and hopefully as producers and directors as well. So as I said, there was 27 women writers who contributed 36 plays to the series. 31 of those plays were original plays, two were co-written, those ones in red here, and uh, three plays were adaptations. A further five plays were authored by men. I'm sure that number will go up as I look into this further, but um, at the moment I've spotted five further plays that were authored by men, but whose source material arose from the work of women. And thankfully all of the plays remain in, in, at bar three, but even the scripts for those missing three texts are accessible via the BBC archive and Cavisham. So the three missing texts are the ones from 1973, three's one, the stretch and making the play. Um, so anyway, if, if we look at that, the, the writers and the plays that they produced, um, it's interesting, as I said, to, to use this as a case study to flesh out um, the histories of those women writers themselves. So this piece of research allows us to consider the writers such as Nemli Lethbridge, who, like Julia Jones, started um, her career writing for um, the Wednesday play um, and who used television um, writing as a way to navigate her rather challenging career in law. Nemini was one of the first female barristers in the UK, um, but because of her turbulent personal life and marrying a, a, a gangster, um, uh, um, she turned to television writing, as did her husband to help um, secure some, some finances, basically. You had other writers such as Julia Jones, who um, was a prolific writer who started her career on, at the Wednesday play as well. And between writing her first play, um, The Navigators, in 1965, by the time she'd written um, the piano for Play for Today, she had um, written um, something like 17 plays for television and contributed about six of the dramas for, uh, for, to, for the series and serials, including being the woman, as Les Cook has identified, to be the first woman to write a series herself for television by, in the way of Grenada's Home and Waves uh, series. Um, 
perhaps uh, more pertinently, the research also shines a light on perhaps more um, less well-known writers of television and, and allows us therefore to uh, really map out those career trajectories, you know, the average kind of career trajectory of female writers. So writers such as Jilly Fraser, Frances Gallimore, Janie Prager, again, you have that crossover in terms of some actresses, first of all, or actors such as Jilly Fraser, who appeared in Doctor Who, then going into writing herself. Um, but looking at the, uh, their credits of what they did write, a lot of these women, it kind of seems to be a standard sort of uh, trajectory where you start writing for soaps um, and then popular series and then move into play production. But the, um, these, if you track their career trajectories past Play for Today and what happened post the 1980s, you see that they tend to go and work in children's television, uh, as writers of children's television, series television, but also more for radio, which speaks to something perhaps of, the, of what happened to television in this more deregulated competitive phase. Um, but in, uh, and and uh, another interesting line of um, inquiry here in terms of the the history of these different writers. Many of the writers for Play for Today um, came from lit literature and, and theatre. So people like Charlotte Bingham, um, but others, um, everyone um, from, uh, I've forgotten her name now. Where we go? Oh, sorry. Where we go? Oh, sorry. I just lost my place in my presentation. Um, right, let me go back. Sorry. Uh, people like Carol Churchill, that's his name I was trying to remember there, but Rachel uh, Billington, Elaine Feinstein, Penelope Mortimer, you know, some of the really big figures associated with um, within uh, British uh, literature and theatre. Uh, and the, one of the figures that I'm particularly interested in looking at is Charlotte Bingham, who, um, whose novel, 90, uh, early 60s novel, or semi-autobiographical account, Coronet Amongst the Weeds, has been seen up there with the likes of Sheila Delaney's work in Nell Dunn for the way it challenged conceptions of, of young womanhood and indeed masculine styles of writing during that period. But Charlotte Bingham also enjoyed um, a 20-year uh, career writing for television along with her husband, Terence Brady, and were responsible for character Avril and Take Three Girls, some of the characters, uh, some of the episodes of um, Upstairs, Downstairs, sitcom No Honestly, and so on. So rich histories there. Um, and then we're mapped with, uh, with uh, if we think about the, the kinds of texts these women wrote. So if we look at you know, production stats, we look at um, uh, the creed trajectories of the women themselves and their experience of the industry, which is the interviews that I'm currently doing. Um, but if we actually look at what the women wrote about, it's perhaps not surprising that um, many of the players were about, uh, and indeed the majority of plays were about female experience or familial strife. So taking leave takes some big themes like incest and sexual abuse within the family and set against the troubles in Northern Ireland, a really interesting drama. Oibe Marie is a comedy, which is looking at um, uh, religion and marriage when you have a, a, a Catholic woman marry a Jewish man. And Breathe is a, um, a bit of a feminist polemic um, a kind of gothic psychological drama by the very esteemed feminist writer Elaine Feinstein. Um, you had others dealing with um, domestic abuse um, within uh, in the UK in the 70s and indeed uh, such texts like Don't Be Silly but also um, Nemi Lethbridge, ba Baby Blues and Paula Min's John David all um, stirred kind of public consciousness and debate at the time they were released for the way in which they um, brought to uh, to bear, you know, the subjects such as domestic violence, but also in the, in, in the instances of Baby Blues and John David, with thinking through um, um, women who were struggling with, um, with, with having children, with childbirth and postnatal depression, and indeed children born with um, disabilities. Um, so really sort of rich dramas. And again, I guess this is part of the project and part of the point about the relationship between um, looking at research and pedagogy, you know, it'd be great to be able to share these kinds of texts with, with students and have copies readily available to demonstrate uh, these sorts of traditions of, of women's writing um, for television, but also um, in, in piecing their traditions together, not only in terms of histories of women writing, therefore, 
but then also to broaden out and flesh out our understandings of television history. So I shall leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vicky, for sharing the insights into your rich research in a much neglected uh, aspect of women's contributions to a very well-known and celebrated uh, BBC television drama, Strand. So thank you for that. Before I introduce our last speaker uh, on this afternoon's session, um, just a reminder to you, to please post any questions you may have in the uh, chat at the side and we'll be picking up on um, any comments, observations or questions in our uh, roundtable chat uh, after the final paper, which comes from Dr. Kenetta Hammond Perry. She's a reader in history and also serves as director of the Stephen Lawrence Research Centre here at De Montfort University. And if you're not familiar with um, uh, that body, do um, uh, Google it and have a look at the um, programme of events and work that the Stephen Lawrence Centre uh, undertakes. Um, Dr Perry's research interests include black British history, transnational race politics, black women's history, and histories of statecrafted violence. She was the author of African, the African Caribbean Migration Narrative, London is the Place for Me, published by Oxford University Press, and is currently writing a book on the life, death, and legacy of David Oluwale. This afternoon, she's gonna be talking about another new project here at DMU, which is our contribution to the BBC's 100 Voices Oral History Project, uh, focusing on the theme of race. So, Kaneta, over to you. Thank you, Justin, for that introduction. And also, uh, thank you for bringing us all together in conversation today. Um, Julia, Vicky, and Govinda, um, in many ways, I want to go ahead and sort of say, um, I've, your research is really fantastic. and. Um, this is an area of work, sort of uh, media and television studies is not necessarily my prime area of, um, of research interest, but I am interested in histories of race and racial formation, um, particularly in, in the UK context. And so um, I'm going to be talking today about a project, the framework around a project that really in many ways um, will not sort of uh, launch in earnest until uh, 2022, but it will be, as Justin said, part of a project that we hope will contribute to um, the BBC's um, centenary project where they are working to um, expand um, the oral history archives around the BBC's imp imprint on British society historically. And so um, the, the kind of working title for the project, um, which I'll kind of talk about the Stephen Lawrence Research Center's involvement, but also um, the ways in which this is a really a DMU project that's bringing together um, units across the university is trying to sort of think about um, marginalized voices and thinking about the way in which um, the platform of the BBC has been a platform that has been a part of the ways that we can think about um, how questions of race and racism and racial formation have um, sort of affected British society and been shaped um, in British society. And I think this very much aligns with the remit of the Stephen Lawrence Research Center, one of those being to produce research that's focused on the histories and cultures of Black, Asian, and racially minoritized communities. So this project is very much in keeping with the type of interdisciplinary cross-faculty research that the, the center was designed um, for um, from its very inception. So I'm just going to sort of, uh, again, talk through the framework of this project that is very much um, in development. And in terms of just, I think, some of the framing that will bring to questions of sort of race and the BBC as a media platform, in my view, um, many of those conversations lead us back to the body of work developed um, by Stuart Hall. And Stuart Hall um, is arguably one of the most uh, preeminent um, uh, black intellectuals um, in it that has sort of uh, spent the majority of his career in, in the British context, but has really shaped 
um, international, global conversations about questions of, of race and media and sort of thinking about the way that the media landscape provides a way to think about race, to think about politics, to think about culture, and to think about society, and to think about the relationships between all of those categories. And in 1973, he wrote a really sort of seminal and widely cited article um, uh, sort of looking at encoding, what he called encoding and decoding um, in, in television, particularly. Um, and I think it's really interesting to think about that article and think about his reflections on this notion of encoding and decoding and the ways that we think about um, media as this landscape for understanding um, society, understanding culture, understanding power, um, understanding politics. And I, I think one of the things that's really important to note about Stuart Hall is that he's really thinking about the ways that sort of the history of television ownership in the UK really coincides with this history of the changing demographic landscape in many cities that's prompted by um, Commonwealth migration, largely from um, the Caribbean, from South Asia, and from um, uh, colonies um, on the African continent. And, and really that kind of the ways in which television usage and the, the kind of incorporation of television culture becomes part of that landscape where British society is sort of making sense of these demographic um, transformations that are also creating social and political um, transformations in British society. I think one of the things that's interesting to note that, you know, in the late 1940s, um, statistically about 1% of, of the British adult population had regular access um, to TV. Um, by 1955, that's going to increase to 40%. And then by 1965, it's going to be um, upwards of, of around 90%. Um, percent. So again, these this moment, um, this sort of moment that's oftentimes talked about as a kind of wind rush moment where we see, again, um, the, the migration of, of people who are citizens who are arriving with different claims to ideas about what it means to be British and, and how that's going to sort of, um, how we're going to sort of think about questions of race in British society. It's really fascinating to think about um, Stuart Hall's work and, and the ways in which he sort of shapes these early conversations about about um, race and some of the things that we're going to take up in, in this particular um, project. I think one of the other things that I'll say about this, this article, Encoding and Decoding, um, is that he gives us a way to think about you know, the media and think about the relationship between producers and, and, and routes of circulation and how ideas circulate through the media but also this, this question of, of consumption and how audiences aren't these sort of passive, um, you know, sort of recipients of these, these messages that are, that are put out in media, that what the, the kind of, um, a kind of script that media might be creating or producing and, and messages about um, society, about people, about ideas, they may sort of start in one vein, but what the audience does with them can take us um, into uh, sort of new directions and create new um, kinds of messaging around um, around what what people are consuming, and that even in that exchange between the producers. Of, of media messages and the consumers of them, we all have to sort of think about the systems and social structures that are also operating that shape the way um, that, that 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 exchange is happening. And Stuart Hall really gives us a, as a sort of critical starting point for sort of understanding some of that work. And, and we'll definitely be thinking about um, the groundwork that he lays as this, this particular project unfolds. So if I'm just sort of, again, kind of laying, uh, talking a little bit about how this, this project is coming into view, um, we're really just sort of, again, setting an agenda about how DMU can be involved in um, what is uh, what has begun as a centenary project um, with the BBC, where they're gathering um, oral histories to sort of think about, again, the BBC's role historically in British society, but not just British society, but also really global society. I mean, if you think about, um, you know, the, the imperial imprint of, of Britain um, in the world um, and the BBC as a part of that, it really opens you up to, to, to the ways in which the BBC and these questions questions around the BBC's histories are, are very much connected to um, a history that extends well beyond um, the nation of Britain, but really is a part of a kind of transnational and global history. And in many ways, DMU's role in sort of thinking about questions of race um, and, and curating a set of oral histories that are going to sort of interrogate um, um, the, the 
BBC's relationship to questions of race and racism. We're also contributing to, again, a larger body of work um, that the BBC has been undertaking with other universities, including the University of Sussex, where they launched a Connected Histories project in partnership with the BBC that's supported by AHRC funding to begin this project of creating a digital archive that is publicly accessible and available for people to explore um, the different um, histories of the, of the BBC uh, and, and the personalities associated with the organization. And part of what we're going to be doing um, as sort of D DMU partners is, again, sort of extending um, that work and contributing to that um, to that uh, to that larger archive. Um, and I think it's really important to note that, again, as I said before, although um, the SLRC is, is one of the gateways into um, sort of developing that work with DMU, it's really a uh, project that we're developing that's collaborative, that's interdisciplinary, and, and it's something that we're going to be doing with partners across the faculty. Um, Gravinda, who's, who's spoken previously, is going to be leading up and um, um, the team around some of this work, but it's, it's a really a cross-faculty, cross-university project between the SLRC colleagues in the media school and ADH and also uh, our, our public engagement team, um, because this is really public facing research that we know will be of value to um, to wider communities in and beyond the, the university. So we're not just trying to sort of just create research, um, sort of pure academic uh, research resources through this project, but we're hoping again to create a project that that raises questions and speaks to, to issues that would be of concern to broader audiences well beyond the university. And the image that I have here is an image of Una Morrison, who was um, uh, the, the first Black woman who was hired by the BBC uh, during, really during World War I. And in 1942, she became the producer of a program called, uh, actually called Calling the West Indies that later turned into Caribbean Voices. And this really became a critical platform for um, engaging the work of, of, of a Caribbean uh, literary community, evolving Caribbean literary community um, in, in the 1940s. And her work um, reminds us of the ways in which, you know, a, a diversity of voices have sort of shaped both content and exposure to different ideas um, on the BBC platform. And she's a sort of reminder of the ways that we can't just think about those who were in front of the camera or content that that's sort of visible on the BBC as a television platform, but that the BBC has sort of a number of different kinds of, of tentacles there. And that's something that we want to explore in the short term and in the longer term with this project. Some of the questions that, that are kind of animating our work is, you know, how does, um, you know, how has the BBC engaged with questions of race and racism historically? What are some of the different vantage points that we can consider when exploring how, again, the BBC has shaped ideas about race and racism? So sort of thinking back to Stuart Hall, this question of how has the BBC sort of functioned as an encoder? And then how has the BBC facilitated certain kinds of decoding or making meaning uh, of these ideas, certain kinds of racial identification and certain kinds of ways in which we understand the operation of race and racism in British society? And then I think, you know, more importantly, um, one of the things that we are doing in this project is trying to expand that archival base for understanding the BBC's role in British society. So how can we create resources for researchers, for students, and then a wider community of people um, to think about the, the BBC's role in, um, in shaping British society? Some of the key themes of the project um, that we're looking at is, again, trying to think about the BBC as a kind of platform for representing and presenting um, certain ways that that um, people think about race. Um, Rob Waters in his article, um, Black Power on the Telly, talked about the ways in which the Black Power movement as a kind of global movement and it's and the ways in which it sort of resonated in British society in the late 1960s and 1970s it in part depended upon the ways in which television becomes this sort of site of racial knowledge, this site of racial identification, and this site of racial dislocation. 
He also sort of talks about the ways in which television provided this kind of proximity for certain kinds of conversations about racial knowledges to form in relation to local events, national events, and indeed international events. So again, there, there's a lot to think about in terms of thinking about the BBC's role as a kind of platform for thinking about race and racism. I also think we're, we're thinking about the BBC's attempts to try to target program, um, programming towards specific racially and ethnically minoritized audiences. Those, those are some of the conversations that we've talked about as a, as a budding research collective. Um, one of the interesting things that I'm really excited about um, is thinking about representations of race in BBC's children's programming. And we're not necessarily just limiting it to children's programming, but we can think about, again, um, you know, oftentimes that this kind of um, there's a wide array in which um, the BBC platform has has become a way in which certain kinds of ideas about race and multiculturalism and, and diversity and the representation of that um, and how the arena of children's program has oftentimes been regarded as a place where certain kinds of more palatable conversations um, have been sort of introduced around um, kind of uh, ideas about race and, and, and questions of diversity and equity and social justice in British society. So that's one of the things that our team has talked a little bit about. And then, of course, um, we're very much interested in these questions of, of how um, marginalized voices, uh, racially minoritized groups, um, Black and Asian representation in front of and behind um, the camera, the list of people that we're curating as part of um, a potential list of, of um of interviewees. And we'll go ahead and say, Michaela Cole, we are more than excited to interview you um, as part of as part of this project. But we're, we're really trying to curate a list of people who, again, are the people that we see on the screen, but also trying to think about the writers, the directors, different kinds of content um, creators. We had a question about, you know, I want to know, you know, who did Floella Benjamin's makeup and like, you know, who who who's doing the lighting around um, BBC platforming when it comes to um, how certain kinds of, of racially minoritized groups are, are represented before um, the film and uh, before before the screen. And so I think there's there's a lot there to think about in terms of um, the direction of travel for this project. I'll just sort of end by talking about some of the things that we're thinking about in terms of projected outputs. Obviously, as part of the BBC Centenary Project, which sort of launched um, what we hope is, is a, a longer-term research agenda for DMU around these issues, but we're going to deliver 10 oral history projects that will be part of that centenary project that will explore some of these questions around um, the BBC's role and its relationship to um, race and, and racism in British society. We're also looking at producing an edited collection. We're sort of, you know, thinking about, you know, how do we make um, these resources ac accessible? How do we think about, you know, what kinds of new research agendas they open up and lend themselves to as part of this project? We very much see this as a publicly engaged project. So we want to think about, you know, creating publicly accessible and public facing um, digital resources, including an exhibition of some of the work um, that we hope to, um, to generate as a part of this project. We are also um, thinking about, or in, in really in the process, um, Gravinda is going to be leading us um, in creating an AHRC network grant um, that's going to allow us to both um, tap into and be more intentional about um, building a kind of network um, with other universities, but also um, building from some of the work that um, even from uh, the, the, the project that um, Justin and Gravinda are working on with the, the CDA. How do we think about some of those other partners um, externally outside of universities that we can partner with to move um, this agenda forward and to generate new and different kinds of, of research agendas around um, that might be attractive to PhD students, um, but also um, that might inform the ways that students in our media school and students who are interested in questions of race across um, uh, DMU might um, begin to engage. I mean, we have really fantastic colleagues in media, but also in technology studies, um, colleagues who are thinking about um, visual imagery in ADH. So we think that this could really be a broad ranging agenda that could bring together colleagues across um, a number of different pockets of the university. And then obviously we're hoping to, to think about longer term partnerships um, and partnership working with the BBC as a part of um, the work that we're pursuing on this project. So again, it's just sort of a whistle stop um, tour around some of our, our thinking about the framework of an emerging research agenda around um, race and the BBC. So I will end there.
Thank you so much, Kaneta, for sharing the rich potential of the um, our contribution here at DMU to that BBC 100 Voices Oral History Project uh, on race. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Um, so thank you. Um, I, we I, I'd like to invite our uh, other panelists back into the room uh, now for ten minutes or so. Uh, yeah for discussion and debate around some of those uh, issues raised by your presentations. Um, uh, if, if there are any questions that you'd like to pose, please, it's not too late to uh, bring those up uh, in the chat. Um, but I'm struck uh, in, in, in listening to all, all four papers uh, about the strengths that clearly researchers are mobilizing here in working with archives and also in oral history and uh, sometimes bringing those methodologies together um, and and also dealing with those in a variety of historical perspectives and so one of the things I'd like to, to, to throw open to you um, is the question of how important histories of broadcasting are to informing current debates about the about challenging boundaries the boundaries that all of your presentations have uh highlighted um and that might take the form perhaps of of saying a little bit more about your impact agendas of your research and and how um you plan to to showcase the work that, that you've embarked upon um Julia, could I start with you? Would you would you mind saying a little bit about that from the perspective of your project on um, the Hungarian film and TV industry? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Justin. Yeah, so uh, obviously <laughs> to answer your question in one word, very important uh, two words, uh, because uh, and I think this is also something that um, very often comes up uh, in our teaching uh, of television, contemporary television, or uh, I'm teaching on, on streaming TV, so, so kind of a, the future of TV, if you like. Uh, and the recurring theme that uh, comes up in, in, you know, engaging with students with all these, you know, about all these issues of, of um, the sort of current status of, of transnational and, and sort of global TV and, and, and the sort of the affordances of, of streaming, uh, transnational affordances and so on. So the recurring thing that comes back, uh, comes up very often is that this is uh, for at least, uh, you know, uh, though for those who study TV history, this is not new at all. All of this that um, we see uh, sort of happening, all these discourses about uh, whether television is now or, or streaming is, is breaking down now uh, sort of uh, national borders or is... Um, is it now breaking down divisions, uh, sort of political divisions, all that stuff? And also uh, the sort of uh, questions about industry changes due to streaming. Uh, it always has this kind of resonance from history, TV history, and also obviously wider histories. Uh, so, for instance, the, uh, just to sort of uh, recite one kind of example that is always brought up when this is uh, this, this cause. So when we... Um, we discuss how many different streaming platforms there are that we need we are supposed to um subscribe to it kind of uh, reminds us of <laughs> excuse me it reminds us of this sort of cable, cable tv boom in the 80s when there was the question of okay how to how many uh, sort of cable channels am i supposed to uh, subscribe now to to be able to watch that tv show and and these uh, and sort of uh, follow my interest so and that's just one small example so i'm going to stop there because i want to give opportunity to others uh, to answer the question but uh, but uh, yeah it is uh, important to contextualize all these debates uh, uh, related to tv uh, in in the history of the, of television cultures industries politics and so on Th thank you thanks for that um you mentioned um the the role of your research in informing your teaching and and that's something that, that vicky picked up on as well and i wonder vicky whether you know what what your students make of um learning about the neglected women uh, of, of of play for today a strand which i'm imagining that many of your your students are, are not as familiar with as, as as certainly we are in the room um what what do they make of of um of of, of your work in that way 
they, they seem to really like it actually the module that i teach regarding two but one about gender specifically um the students are amazed actually by the, the sort of rich tapestry of representations they are so we look at play for today wednesday play we look at texts like take three girls i mean I'm, I'm, i feel very fortunate that because i've been researching this area for quite a period of time i have collected by various means copies of stuff that i can show and i've got scripts and things so i feel you know but that takes a lot of time to build up when those resources aren't there so as I said, box of broadcasters is, is great because we can then address two things. We can address invisibility. You know, we can say how you can bring to the fore what resources we do know, what we do have, to put those those histories back on the agenda, to make them visible. But if there are absences and gaps, we can also then have a dialogue about those absences and gaps. And you know, it does feel very circular. The, the writers guild produced, produced, uh, produced a report in two thousand eighteen. Um, which talked about um, this self-sustaining loop of inequality for writers within the industry. And I guess this historical work, what we can do is therefore historicize and contextualize where those patterns come from. What has really shifted and changed since that 1973 report by the BBC? The other thing that I find fascinating looking at histories is, you know, we have this very term, post-feminism, that's, that's talked about a lot in media. But then if you go back, you can see elements of the 60s television and so on that had elements of that. So, you know, you, you, it just co complexifies life to a greater degree and TV representations. And it, it, and it also okay, it just basically fleshes out our understanding of the social world. I think it was um, Helen Wheatley in her lovely book on TV history. She said, you know, if you've got it, I think she was quote, 14 years of um, which is saying, you know, if you have a, if you understand the history of television, you wouldn't understand the history of everything else. And I think that's really pertinent. Mm -hmm. That's that's a lovely pithy phrase that that, uh, that, that that's uh, highly appropriate for for World Television Day. Th th thanks, Vicky. Um, I'm going to turn to you, Govinda, and, and and I wonder whether you could say a little bit more about what the planned partnership with Sampad um, in Birmingham. It, it is is going to bring in terms of impact potential to the collaborative doctoral award what we're hoping to do is the student will re learn a range of skills in their placement with them but one of the things that we were kind of exploring is the potential to hold some sort of large culmination event at the end of the study whereby key people in broadcasting history in particular in british asian broadcasting history could come together and I guess related to your first question, kind of look at the how the historical debate on the rise of ethnic media and its impacts in our broadcasting landscape sort of does inform the current debate, uh, because the current debate is very much about how, to, how do you serve all audiences and how do we serve them adequately? Because it's not just okay to represent them in minute ways, that they need to be more, more robust. Um, so that's what we hope to do at the end. And Sampad are gonna help us organize the event, um, and also we kind of maybe envisioning um, a website whereby we can take some of the materials from the ZTV archives and then share those with the public as well. So they're going to play quite a pivotal role in the public engagement side of the study, which is quite critical into finding out what the legacy of ZTV was and then mapping that to understanding how ZTV and its sort of um, appearance in the 90s now informs and influences the current debate in within our national broadcasting and within minority broadcasting as well. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for that. That's really, really interesting. Um, uh, Kaneta, um, coming to the, the BBC oral history uh, project, um, I mean, in, in some respects, one, one might say that, you know, now the BBC are fully aware of um, the agenda, if you like, of, of, of diversity and indeed are spending a good deal of their time, um, uh, you know, in, in engaging with the need to address um, that whole set of, uh, of issues. Um, how might we bring, uh, you know, the, the oral history of, of, of those individuals we're hoping to, uh, to speak with into um, those kind of debates? Or are there yeah. other opportunities for um, dissemination? 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's something that that we're one of the things that the oral history provides, and I think the project provides is is to, to sort of speak to what everybody here is that that we need to historicize these things so that at the end of the day, you know, we, when we're seeing kind of where you're trying to understand what the impetus is behind, you know, diversity initiatives at the BBC or the hiring of new staff devoted to certain kinds of, of diversity initiatives and sort of, you know, that we can sort of interrogate and scrutinize those things very differently if we kind of are able to track, you know, a history of the organization's relationship um, to questions of race, particularly from those who have worked within the organization and been a part of the organization as and experience racialization within the context of the BBC. I think, so that's a big part of, I think, of what we would do in the first phase of the project. One of the other things I think I'm really excited about in terms of potential afterlives of the, the centenary project though, is thinking more about, you know, interviewing um, the way, you know, people who, you know, engage with the BBC and thinking about how they have interpreted the ways that um, the BBC has functioned as, as a kind of resource for certain kinds of, um, you know, the development of certain kinds of racial knowledges and identifications and, and, and things like that. And that's where I think the terrain is, is really wide open. Um, and, and one thing I didn't mention as well is that there's a there's some real Lester specific angles around the BBC's history, particularly um, BBC radio history in Leicester that, that I think it will be really rich um, to, to, to consider as part of um, some, some kind of wider um, tentacles of, of this, this emerging project. Thank you very much. That, that, that's great. Um, so um, I, I hope it's, it's clear how uh, DMU uh, uh, scholars are working here to uh, make those kind of connections between uh, the local, the regional, the national and, and the transnational um, through different but intersecting networks of television history research um, to really break new historical ground, um, but also very much to, to mobilise um, those projects and, and that evidence in various ways with various communities from our own students, undergraduates, postgraduates, um, through to uh, community projects and, and wider uh, agendas, which is very much um, what drives and motivates the television history research um, that we're all engaged with. So to um, wind up proceedings today, it um, remains for me to thank um, all four of our presenters, uh, my, my colleagues here at DMU for sharing their current research, their work in progress and the projects that we have uh, very much on the starting blocks. You know, these are all live research projects um, uh, that are underway. And to remind you that this presentation and the details of all the uh, talks this afternoon are going to be available via our DMU events uh, website. So you can go back to um, these talks uh, in the future and take them away with you. Um, so please do do that. And we're delighted uh, with all kind of connections and networks and opportunities to talk further about our research. So if you're interested in work in this area, do get in touch with us. Um, and we'd be very happy to speak with you. Um, so for now, uh, thank you once again to uh, all this afternoon's presenters for sharing their research. Um, thanks to our DMU events team for the organisation. And it only remains for me to wish you all a happy World TV Day. Thank you. <laughs>